Good morning and welcome to virtual Birmingham Unitarian Church. I am the Reverend Mandy Beal. I am this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined today in worship leadership by our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering, and also with a lot of technical support and help and love from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis. Until we are able to be together in our building again, our worship services will be hosted on Zoom on Sunday mornings at 1030 and then later posted onto our Facebook page. Birmingham Unitarian Church is a welcoming congregation. This is a designation that a UU church can earn after demonstrating uh, wanting to learn about and do the work of being fully inclusive of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and their families. There is not a similar designation for racial justice work, but that matters to us very much as well. We are also a green sanctuary congregation, which is another designation for a congregation that does environmental justice work. Today was meant to be our 50th anniversary celebration of Earth Day. This day is a special event for many UUs, and we had a very exciting multi-generational worship service planned that included arts and song and storytelling, all kinds of cool stuff. But I made the decision to shift the focus of today's service to our quarantine needs, and I hope that we'll be able to find a way to acknowledge that service at another point. And indeed, we acknowledge Earth Day every day through our actions and by supporting legislation that promotes environmental concerns. There will be a coffee hour after the service today. You will be randomly sorted into breakout groups and we hope that you'll participate in this opportunity to connect with others. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you'll stay after the service and get to know people in our virtual coffee hour. And as a reminder to our regular worship participants to please be extra welcoming to new people. We have a few announcements this week. First, the Board of Trustees hosted a town hall meeting on Friday night. That meeting included several pastoral tones. So in the interest of discretion, we will not be posting the recording of that meeting publicly on our Facebook page but it is available to watch through another platform. If you would like to watch that recording, please email Sarah Constantakis and she will provide you with a link. There will also be a link in this week's email update. Secondly, as an extra precaution against Zoom bombing of our services, you will notice that your chat bar is disabled as is the ability to unmute yourself during the service. You will be unmuted before the virtual coffee hour this is our first week experimenting with this, so we ask for your patience as uh, Sarah practices muting and unmuting worship leaders. Uh, one other worship-related announcement. I have, I'm very excited to let you know that over the next couple of weeks, uh, on an every other week basis, we will join in worship with the Community Unitarian Universalists Brighton and the People's Church of Kalamazoo. We are going to be uh, doing what we are going to call a virtual UU megachurch experience. On April 26th, your BUC worship team will be leading the service, and in May 10th and May 24th services will be led by other worship teams. BUC folks will continue using the same Zoom link, so it'll be basically the same for you, but with more people, please do remember to wear pants as we're adding an extra people to our services. And finally, a quick mention of what it is to be in social isolation. Please remember to call each other, especially call people who live alone. We need your help to submit names of people that want to participate in social phone calls. If you want someone to call you or you know someone that wants a call, please visit our website and submit that information. I ask that you think especially of people who don't use technology during this time. Thank you again for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit, and it is good to be together again. And with that, our morning service will begin. This morning's prelude is a waltz by Spanish Romantic composer Jose Ferrer.
We are worshiping in our separate homes this morning, but we are joined by a multitude of Unitarian Universalists and lighting our chalice. We light this chalice to honor the deep worth and dignity of every person. Let this flame be a beacon to love, calling each of us into a deeper relationship with each other and with the core of our being. singing our first hymn. Our first hymn is Spring Has Now Unwrapped the Flowers, number 63. Let's join our voices in song. this morning are from Kimberly Ann Tomchak Carlson. It is not by chance that you arrived here today. You have been looking for something larger than yourself. Inside of you there is a yearning, a calling, a hope for more, desire for a place of belonging and caring. Through your struggles someone nurtured you into being, instilling a belief and a shared purpose, a common yet precious resource that belongs to all of us when we share. And so you began seeking a beloved community, a people that does not put fences around love, a community that holds its arms open to possibilities of love, a heart home to nourish your soul and share your gifts. Welcome home. Welcome to worship. We have reached the time in our service when we ask for your financial support. There is no source of funding for BUC other than the ones that we create. We all know the financial strain that the COVID-19 pandemic has created in our economy. BUC is under that strain as well. Your church leadership is doing everything that we can to support the stability of our congregation. And now I ask you to join us in those efforts. Your contributions can be, used, can be sent using Venmo or through our website. Our Venmo username is at BUCMI, or if you navigate to our website, there is a donate now button. If you need to set up accounts through either of these giving platforms, I urge you to do so when the service is over. You can always also put a check in the mail to us. I ask you to consider how much you've relied on BUC in the past two months and to do what you can to support our good work. Please give generously. The offertory song this morning is in honor of Earth Day and uh, with appreciation for our natural world. 
Steve wrote the music. Appa wrote the lyrics. This is Quiet Creature. Let's move now into a time of prayer, reflection, and centering. We begin every week with a sharing of joys and sorrows from our community. This week, we start with a note of joy from Stephanie and David Greer, who celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary with an at-home meal on their wedding gift dishes while listening to piano music of Rachmaninoff played by Cynthia Rehm, a former BUC church pianist. Also, Dave Luckins, 
would like to let us know that Ginger Luckins is celebrating the completion of another orbit around the sun. I have a note of personal joy today. Wednesday marks the second anniversary of my ordination into the Unitarian Universalist Ministry. I'm grateful for the First Unitarian Universalist Society in Newton for conferring this honor upon me and to Birmingham Unitarian Church for calling me as your senior minister only four months later. I'm also grateful to Jesse Beal for their unwavering support of my ministry. From Dick Cantley in Dick's words, Barb Eschner and I ask for your prayers and positive energy as we begin our journey for a paired kidney transplant. Wednesday is Barb's initial evaluation by video with the University of Michigan Transplant Center. If all goes well, UM will find matches for us both so I can donate my type A kidney and Barb receives someone's type O kidney. And Dick says, thank you for your support. And finally, from Annis Pratt. Annis says, my daughter, Lorian in Denver has COVID and I am devastated. I invite you now to move further into a space of prayer and centering with me. During this time of many feelings, during this time of newness and sameness, let us each of us be felt by each other. Let us feel each other, let us be felt. Let us be held in love, the love of each other, the love of this community, the love that surrounds us all, the love that holds the universe together. As we become quieter, as our world becomes smaller, let us remember the boundless energy that unites us and that surrounds us. May us hold one another, may we be held. May it be so, amen and blessed be. This morning's reading is from Julian of Norwich. Julian was a Christian mystic living in 14th century Norwich, England. She had 16 mystical visions that centered around the theme of God's love. Our reading today is an excerpt from her first revelation and the reading is accompanied by an icon made by contemporary Franciscan friar Robert Lentz. I saw that God is to us everything which is good and comforting for our help. He is our clothing who wraps and unfolds us for love, embraces and shelters us, surrounds us for his love, which is so tender that he may never desert us. And so in this sight, I saw that he is everything which is good as I understand. And in this, he showed me something so small no bigger than a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, 
as it seemed to me, and it was round as a ball. I looked at it with the eye of my understanding, and I thought, what can this be? I was amazed that it could last, for I thought that because of its littleness, it would suddenly have fallen into nothing. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasts and always will because God loves it. And thus everything has being through the love of God. In these days of a life grown smaller, I've been thinking a lot about Julian of Norwich and her hazelnut and thinking a lot about people who live in cloisters. There is an easy connection between our quieter, slower lives and the cloistered life. In the days leading up to Governor Whitmer's stay home, stay safe order, I reached for my copy of Julian of Norwich's writings, as did many others. Dame Julian is a fascinating character in the history of spirituality. We know basically nothing of her life. In fact, her name wasn't Julian. That was the name of the church that she was associated with. There are a few documents that confirm her historiosity, but even those are scant. The bulk of what we know is that she lived in 14th century Norwich. She had 16 visions of divine love, which she committed to writing, and she was an anchoress. Anchorites lived in extreme solitude and rigorous spiritual practice. They were called anchorites because they were anchored to a church, meaning they were literally walled into the side of a church. An anchorite had two to three rooms and had a few servants that brought them food and other necessities. And that was it. To our modern sensitivity, it sounds awful, even abusive, but this lifestyle was only taken on by choice. In fact, usually by someone with a certain level of financial means to afford the servants. Anchorites were deeply respected and considered holy in their time. In such a quiet and focused setting, an anchorite devoted their life to prayer. And this is still the case for many people living in cloisters today. Years ago, I took a class on Benedictine spirituality. And at the start of the class, I was pretty sure that I hated Benedict Benedictine spirituality. They spend over six hours a day in prayer, including chanting all the Psalms, all 150 Psalms every single day. And to me, choosing a life dedicated to prayer in a cloister was unfathomable. The most important aspect of theology for me is that it is connected to reality and that it does something in the world. The idea of living separately in either a modern cloister or in a 14th century anchor and doing nothing but prayer all day was really upsetting. If you believe something so strongly, I thought, why not get out and do something with it? And the capstone of the Benedictine spirituality class was spending three days and two nights at a priory. And by this point, I was utterly done with Benedictine spirituality. And I went to the priory with my hackles up and a puss on my face, ready to have a horrible time. I did not have a horrible time. I found the nuns to be lovely, warm, welcoming, Spending time at the Priory completely changed my understanding of cloistered life. I had assumed that life in a cloister was an intentional separation from the world, a checking out. I was quite wrong. Toward the end of our visit, one of the nuns met with our class. This was in the spring of 2016, and there was a lot of anxiety and turmoil in our country as the political rhetoric was heating up. And someone asked her, do you know what's going on out there? Don't you feel frustrated that you're here and you can't do anything about it? And she smiled warmly and she said, yeah, I know what's going on. And I'm so glad that I'm here where I can do something about it. I can pray. It was 
surprising to me. I felt very caught off guard by her response because I felt the truth, the sincerity of her answer, and I was also a bit chagrined. And this story has been on my mind a lot this week, as many of you have told me how very frustrated you are. When there is a crisis, your impulse and what you're accustomed to doing is to get out there and to do something. You want to deliver protective gear to essential workers and to serve food to the homeless and deliver groceries to our elders. And there are opportunities that exist for that hands-on work, but they are limited and they are risky. And of course, these are real and serious needs, but there have always been real and serious needs. And I wonder why the frustration of not being able to do something out there is reaching a boiling point this week. Why now? It is so much easier to stay busy than it is to be still. And I think a lot of us have been playing with the idea of being still, but the reality of our new, deep, and unchosen stillness is really starting to sink in now. And perhaps the question underlying this frustration is, why do we always feel like we need to be doing something? In American culture, we define ourselves by what we do. We say, I am a lawyer. I am a teacher, et cetera. That's part of the spiritual crisis of late stage capitalism. We've become convinced that we are what we do, but you are not your job. You are not your service work. You are not your projects. These activities do not define you. They may be an expression of who you are, but they do not constitute you. Your value is not derived from your productivity. Your value comes from your place in the human family, the family of life. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote the inherent dignity and worth of every person. Our task is to locate and to nurture the part of ourselves that deeply and truly knows that dignity and worth. So I suggest to you in the tradition of the cloistered that prayer is one such avenue for diving into that deep well of being. I realize that Unitarian Universalists are dubious about prayer it reminds us of traditions that we have left or that would no longer have us. But I think that reluctance, that pushback against prayer has, has to do something with misconceptions about prayer. For example, it is widely believed that prayer is an attempt to persuade God to intervene in human affairs. Or prayer is understood to be a wish list for what we want God to give us. And there are people who pray that way, to be sure. But I sincerely doubt that Julian of Norwich spent all of those years walled up in solitude, praying that God would send her what she wanted for lunch. Beyond those surface level prayers, there is a prayer life based in deep listening and grounding. Prayer can be used to understand one's place in the world or to make peace with the world. Prayer is about deepening our spiritual experience, and it is a tool available to all theological perspectives, even atheism. Prayer does not have to be addressed any place in particular. That is why I often introduce the prayer section of our services by saying that it is time to get in touch with our hearts. One of the most effective ways to pray is through asking questions. In our current context, one might ask, how can I ease the world's pain? 
how can I make peace with the limitations that I'm currently under? Or how do I know my own value? Choose one question, then meditate on that question, listening to your heart for the answer. Now, after you've asked the question and you've listened for the answers, considering, consider reflecting then on how you feel about those answers. Do the answers to your prayerful question make you happy, sad, angry? I recommend keeping a journal of your prayer experience. And this is my challenge to each of you over the coming week. Take 15 minutes a day or four times during the week and try this prayer practice. You might be surprised about what you learn about yourself. This simple form of prayer is a way that you can deepen your relationship with your core being that knows your inherent worth and dignity. Your worth is not tied to your productivity. It is your birthright. During this great pause, let's take a step back and let's reflect on what it is to be worthy of love, to be held in love without needing to do anything at all. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Our closing hymn today is a beloved Shaker song I feel sure you are familiar with. Please join in singing Simple Gifts. to this world grown small and find the expansiveness of your soul. Remember your deep love and worth and share that with those around you. Amen.